to this session. My name is Yvonne Lumbasio. The unit code is DHT2206 and CHT1117. Uh, the unit title is Tour Operations. I'm from the Department of Travel and Tourism Management, School of Hospitality, Travel and Tourism Management. I uh, will start by definition of terms in tour operations. And the first term that we'll be defining is a trip. This is an organized journey to a specific place for a specific reason, and it is usually for a day. So when a person is going for a trip, they're not supposed to take more than a day. Uh, next, we'll be defining what a tour is. It is an organized journey to different or many destinations for a period of more than 24 hours, but less than 12 consecutive months. Uh, it is also important to note that the difference between a trip and a tour is a trip, it takes less than 24 hours or a day, and it can also be referred to as an excursion or a short journey. But for a tour, you visit several destinations within a period of more than 24 hours, but less than one consecutive year, which is 12 months. Next, we'll be defining an itinerary. It is a roadmap or a schedule that is usually prepared by the tour operator, which entails the different destinations to be visited, the activities to be undertaken, the departure and arrival time, and the date of the tour that is usually prepared on behalf of the tourist. So basically, an itinerary is a work plan or a schedule that is prepared on behalf of the tourist by the tour operator which is meant to, to act as a guiding factor when they are out there on the safari. And next we'll be defining who a tour operator is. And we are saying that this is a person who has the responsibility of putting the tour packages together, marketing them, making reservations, and handling the actual operations of the entire tour. So a tour operator is the person that puts together the packages, markets different destinations, makes reservations on behalf of the tourists, and on the actual day when the tourist is on the ground, they're the ones to take care of all the logistics that will be entailed in the tour. Uh, after defining what a trip is, a tour, an itinerary, and a tour operator, then you can proceed to look at the types of tour operators that exist. And the first one is mass market tour operators. They purely deal with a large group of tourists or large number of people who intend to visit different destinations at a specific period of time. So the mass tour operators are those tour operators that deal with a group of people. For example, if you, are, you have friends that are more than 10 or family members, or colleagues, those are the people that these master operators handle their tours out there. They deal with many people who intend to go to different destinations. Next, we have specialist tour operators. These are tour operators that provide their services to a specific target group that have some interest in a specific area or activity. So with specialist tour operators, mostly they deal with those specialist tour, tourists who want to do specific activities at different destinations. For example, they can decide to, to concentrate on those people that love hiking and mountain climbing, or they can decide to choose a target group of the bankers. So they, they usually have specialist tour packages for specific group of people. Next is domestic tour operator. These are tour operators who provide services to the residents of a specific country within their boundaries. They are also known as residential tour operators because they always have the knowledge about the attractions found in the countries and the specific period or places to visit. So basically domestic tour operators are those tour operators that operate within a specific country. For example, those tour operators that operate within Kenya and take tourists to visit the attractions that are found in Kenya. And the, the reason why they're called domestic tour operators is because they have the knowledge and the geographical area of what is contained in different touristic circuits. And next we have outbound tour operators. They provide services of a particular country. They provide services of a particular country who intend to visit another country or continent. In most cases, they sell their tour packages and products 
to the residents who live in the same continent as, as them, but intend to travel to other countries. So outbound tour operators, they usually have packages with that and operate within a specific country. For example, we, we might have an outbound tour operator operating within Kenya, but this out, outbound tour operator has packages for Dubai, Mauritius, USF, France, ETC. So what they do is they come up with international tour packages and sell to the residents of Kenya who wish to visit Dubai. Uh, next we have inbound tour operators. They provide services to tourists visiting from other countries. They basically offer any assistance to the tourists arriving in their countries to tour. They are also referred to as receptive tour operators since they always make arrangements for airport transfers formulations of itineraries and offering guiding services to the tourists when they visit their countries of operations. So what we are saying is inbound tour operators are those that are found in a particular country and they handle international tourists that intend to visit the specific attractions that are found in their country of operation. Uh, number six, we have direct sell to operators. They sell their packages directly to the tourists and they don't need an intermediary to get the tourists. Hence, this is an added advantage because the tourists end up paying less for the tour. Uh, in the tourism industry, we have the wholesalers who are usually the tour operators because they come up and formulate uh, quite a number of packages who sell the packages to the retailer who are usually the travel agents who can purchase the packages in wholesale from the tour operators who in return sell to the consumers who are usually the tourists. So with the direct sell to operators, we don't need the retailer who is the travel agent. The tour operator simply comes up with the packages and sells them directly to the tourists. And we are saying the tourists usually have an advantage because with the direct sell to operators, they don't need any added commission that the retailer is supposed to get. So they buy the package directly from the tour operator who makes their profit without any commissions. And number seven, we have retail tour operators. These are the main distribution channels in any tour package since they link tour operators with the tourists. Mostly they earn a commission from the tour operator depending on the number of clients that they get. As a result, they're usually involved in extensive marketing of different tour products so as to be able to maximize their commission. As I had explained earlier, we said that in the, tour, in the tourism industry channel, chain of distribution, we have the wholesalers who are the tour operators, we have the retailers who are the re travel agents, and finally we have the consumers who are the tourists. So basically the retail tour operators, they act as a link or an intermediary between the tourist and the tour operator. These are the tour oper retail tour operators. They usually buy packages in bulk from the tour operators, which they sell to the clients. Now, what they use to buy, the amount of money that they use to buy the package from the tour operators is not what will be sold to the tourist. They have to add on top some amount which is usually known as their commission. So basically they market the packages that different tour operators have for them to be able to get quite a number of tourists and as a result, maximize on their commission and profits. And number eight, we have wholesale tour operators. They usually sell their packages through a well-established retail distribution channel and charge a commission of between 15 to 20% of the actual cost of the tour. Their main role is always to ensure that they come up with favorable tour packages in bulk and sell them to the retailers that will ensure the tourists get the packages. So wholesale tour operators are those that sit down and they have all the touristic circuits in mind and they decide to do quite a number of bulk tour packages which they sell to the retail travel agents and the commission that they usually make, or rather the retail travel agents, they're allowed to make a commission of between 15 to 20% of the actual price, so as to make sure they're not exploiting the tourists and ensure 
tourist retention in the future business. So basically from the word wholesale we get that these are people that have bulk of tour packages that they sell to different tour to different travel agents and at some time they can also sell to their colleagues in the tour operations business. Uh, having looked at the types of tour operators, you can now look at the functions of a tour operator. And the main function of a tour operator in any destination or in the tourism industry is to act as a link or an intermediary between the destination and the client. Without the tour operator, the, the, the destination might never get the client and the client might never reach to the destination. So a tour operator is very important in the tour business because these are the people that interact fast with the client before they take them to different destinations like national parks and different accommodation facilities. I uh, can also say that they are also responsible for operating and providing vacation through contracting, booking and packaging together of the various components of the tour such as hotel, transportation, meals, guides, optional tours and sometimes flights. So in simple terms, they usually do bookings on behalf of the clients of different hotels, flights. They also provide transfer services from one point to another. For example, if a client gets into Jomo Kenyatta International Airport and they need to be transported to a hotel in the CBD, it is the work of the tour operator to ensure that there is a vehicle that will channel these tourists from the airport to the final destination, which is the hotel. Uh, they also come into contract on behalf of the tourists with the different destinations and especially the hotels where the tourists will be accommodated. So it is the work of the tour operator to sign contracts with different hotels and agreements, terms of agreements, before their client arrives. Uh, a tour operator is like a service provider providing the most convenient option for tourists to stay, visit, as well as live from the city. A tour operator owns a high volume of travel services across carriers and accommodation. Now, just as I said, in the tourism industry, tour operators are very important elements. The industry cannot be proactive without the tour operators. Why? Because it is the tour operators that have the responsibility of bringing tourists to visit different touristic sites and attractions. So without the tour operators in any tourism industry, tourism might not take place at the end of the day. And that's why there are very important components in, in the chain, in the distribution chain, in the tourism industry. So they also plan tours for different tourists through coming up with the itineraries regarding the destinations or the specific circuits that the tourists intend to visit. Uh, these itineraries must always be guided by the tourist because at the end of the day, it is the tourist that is going to the safari. So always ensure that you know the specific circuit or the area of interest of the tourist and also the budget that this tourist has in mind. You don't want to do an exaggerated kind of an itinerary and at the end of the day, the tourist is not able to pay for the safari. So always consult your tourist before coming up or planning any tour. Uh, they also develop or formulate or make different tour packages. As I'd said earlier, we have seven touristic circuits in Kenya and it is the work of the tour operators to come up or formulate the tour packages for these specific circuits with regard to the attractions that are found in them. So a tour operator can decide to do several packages for several destinations. Just in case a tourist pops in and tells them, I want to go to Mombasa, they must always have something to show them. After which the client can decide to adjust or stick with the package that had been formulated earlier. Uh, when making the tour packages, again, it is very important to observe the financial status of the tourists because what the tourist intends to spend according to their budget will determine the tour package that you are going to come up with and the specific attractions to visit them. Next, they organize and arrange tours on behalf of different tourists 
tour operators make tour packages and also arrange a tour according to the tourist demands. Tour operators uh, usually arrange various tourist activities to provide the best experience to the tourists and the traveler. So it is the work of the tour operator to come up with a tour arrangement that will favor the tourists. If this tourist is interested with the Western Circuit, it is your work to plan everything. From when you'll pick this client from the airport, the first attraction that you'll be taking them to, the second attraction, the third attraction, the means of transport that you intend to use, the accommodation facilities that you're going to take them to, the, the do's and don'ts during the safari, and also if they'll be required to engage themselves in any extra activities while in the tour, it's always good to arrange it to them and clearly indicate to them if the extra activities will be part of the tour costing or they'll pay it separately from the tour package. Travel information. Whatever the size of tour operators, it has provided necessary travel information to the tourists. This task is utterly, utterly difficult and very complicated. A tour operator must give up-to-date, accurate and timely information regarding different destinations, the modes of transport, the accommodation facilities, the health and safety issues, the immigration issues, the rules about the permits required to travel in a particular area, and also the rules and regulations when visiting different destinations. So basically they provide information, any information that they feel is right for the tourists to get before they can go on the safari. Uh, we, while providing the information to the tourists, at the end of the day they are also marketing these different destinations. Uh, travel information is very important because any tourist do not want to go to a destination when they don't know of their terms and conditions. Uh, they also do reservations of different hotels, flights. Uh, they also reserve different places to visit on behalf of the tourists. So you'll find that it can be very hectic for you to just wake up and check into a hotel without any prior reservations. For example, you're in Nairobi and you go to Iso Isiolo without booking or reserving any hotel and you arrive very late and you find that all the hotels are fully booked. So there you are in Isiolo, you are stranded and you don't have anywhere to accommodate yourself. That's why we are saying to operators, play a very important role in reservations. Once a reservation is done for you, what you need to do is simply go to the hotel and check in without asking if there's any room for you or any vacant space. Uh, next is travel ma management. Tour operators manage tours from the beginning to the end of the tour. A tour operator has the responsibility to look after the finer details of a vacation or tour, such as hotel, accommodation, meals, conveyance, etc. Tour operators provide travel guide, escorting services, and arrange all the travel-related needs and wants together with the logistics. So it is the tour operator that is in charge of any tour that they intend to take their visitors to. From the moment when they start the safari, it is the tour operator who will be in charge of the entire tour. And in case anything happens while on the safari, it is always the tour operator who is answerable on what happened to the tourist. So they also provide guiding services at different destinations. For example, when they visit Nairobi National Park, they can provide guiding services to the tourist. They also do escorting services. For example, a tourist has checked into a hotel and they just realized they forgot to purchase something or they need to rush into a chemist to get some medicine. It is the work of the tour operator to take these tourists to where they need to go and back to the hotel. And they arrange all the travel-related needs and wants together with the logistics. Next is promotion. Our tour operators make tour packages and promote them into various tourist markets as domestic, at domestic as well as international levels. Tour operators, tour operators promote travel destination to attract a large group of tourists at domestic 
and well as international levels. So they usually do promotions about different tour packages with regard to specific destinations. Of course, they walk into a destination, they discuss with the stakeholders on the logistics that will be involved when they do a promotion. Once they're in agreement with the stakeholders, they can go ahead and do posters and billboards and they can also post on their social medias about the promotion that they have about a specific destination. And those interested can purchase the package and they are able to go. So mostly with promotions, what happens is if a tour package is supposed to, call th to cost $300, when it's being promoted, between the, when an agreement is met between the tour operator and the specific destination stakeholders, there is usually a subsidized fee of maybe $200 instead of $300 that you pay. So with promotions, you pay a lesser amount to visit a specific destination as compared to what was initially in the package. Uh, next is sales and marketing. And I said it's very important because it's the two operators who market and sell different attractions that are found in any country within the country and out of its borders. So they are marketers. These are the people that know what is found in Nairobi National Park, the places where the hotels are situated, etc. And next we'll be looking at characteristics of two operators, products and services. And characteristic number one is perishability. Tourism products and services are usually perishable in nature in the sense that if not used and consumed at the right time, they are usually lost. Now, these products are perish perishable in nature, just the way flowers are perishable in nature. And a good example is, I'll use this period that you are in right now because of COVID-19. Most people have not visited national parks. Most people have not visited different accommodation facilities. Uh, Right now we are on the high season because of the migration that is taking place in Masai Mara National Reserve. But people are not going to Masai Mara National Reserve. Hence the products that are found down there, they are not consumed at the right time. Hence they will be lost. You all know that the migration begins in July and ends towards end of September. Now, because of COVID-19 and travel restrictions, people are not able to go down to Masai Mara to experience the migration. Come September, the migration will be done. Hence, the product was not consumed at the right time. Hence, it is lost. We can also give an example of accommodation facilities that still use Masai Mara because during this period, it's peak down there in Masai Mara, many people are going to Masai Mara because of the migration. Now we have hotels down there in Masai Mara and lodges and resorts. They have beds that can accommodate a specific number or capacity of people. But right now we are not receiving any visitors going to occupy those beds during this time. So the occupancy rates of those beds between July and September will be lost. You cannot carry forward the occupancy rate between July and September to another period. Just the same way you cannot push the migration to December. So these products and services, if they're not consumed at the right time, they're usually lost, and that's why we are saying they're perishable. Uh, characteristic number two is intangible. Intangible is that act of not able to touch something but you can only feel and in this case the services can only be touched or seen but the services can't be touched or seen but can only be felt either the tour guiding services you go on a safari with a tour operator and they are there offering tour guiding services to you there is no way you can touch the tour guiding services but you can only feel through the guiding services that are being offered to you. And that's why we are saying the services are intangible. You cannot touch or see them, but you can only feel the service that is being offered to you. You walk into a hotel and you are served. You can only feel the service, but you cannot touch the service. Uh, cannot be separated. Tourism products and services can never be separated because they must be consumed from their place of production. This means that the products and services must always work 
together and one can't be separated from the other. A good example is the national park together with its flora and fauna. Now there is no way you can now, like right now you can go pick Savo East National Park and bring it to Thika and leave the fauna there together with the flora. They have to be consumed together and at one place. They cannot be separated. Can't be measured. The products and services in terms of satisfaction can never be measured for a refund. And a good example of this is you as a professional tour operator, before you take your tourist on a safari, you must do a briefing to them. Now, during this briefing, it's always advised that you don't exaggerate to them what you're not sure they'll be able to see. For example, if you're taking them to Masai Mara National Reserve, uh, the reason why I'm using Masai Mara National Reserve because right now we are at the peak and this is when they receive a lot of visitors because of the migration. Now we have the big five in Masai Mara National Reserve. Uh, during the briefing you tell your tourists that you're going to see the big five. Now on the day of the safari the tourists pay you the cash and you're good to go. But when you arrive at Masai Mara National Reserve you only see the three of the big five. You don't see two. So there's no way the tourist can tell you that because we only saw two and we didn't see two, we, we only saw three and we didn't see the other two, give us a refund of the other two that we didn't see. So these services can never be measured because at the end of the day, even if you didn't see the big five, but a tour took place. You went to Masai Mara National Reserve, transport was provided, accommodation facilities were provided, guided services were provided, ETC. So it can never be measured for a refund. If a tourist is not satisfied, there is no way you can tell them now take this $10 as a refund and all that. Highly sensitive. Uh, the tourism products and services are very fragile and sensitive in the sense that if they are affected by anything, they definitely go down. And a good example is the pandemic that we are having right now the COVID-19. It has really affected the tourism industry because you are not receiving any visitors visiting different destinations. Hence, what happens? Most of the tour operators have lost their jobs. The government is not able to get their taxes. Many touristic destinations have shut down because they are not able to cater for their needs. So they are usually affected. Any negative change that take, takes place in any country or any destination affects the tourism industry negatively and that's why we are saying it is highly sensitive some of the impacts are terrorism when we have terrorism in any country definitely some of the country will tend to to offer travel advisories and advise their people not to visit this country because it's not secure we have natural calamities like floods floods can make you not visit a place uh, we have travel advisories, as I'd said, and then hostility from the host communities. If you visit a place and the hosts of that place are not uh, hospitable with you, you'll not want to go back to them. So it is a very highly sensitive industry that once it, is, it has been affected, picking up will take quite a number of time or days. Multiple producers... The products and services can never be produced by a single entity in the industry. Each of the components usually has a specific specialization in the chain of distribution so as to ensure customers' satisfaction. So with multiple producers, what we are saying is in the tourism industry, the products cannot be produced by one person and consumed. For example, national parks cannot be independent. They need to operators to bring visitors to them. They need hospitality facilities in terms of accommodation so that the tourists can relax after a long day. They need the banking industry so that the tourists can deposit their entry fees. So multiple producers means the tourism industry has many producers that provide different services be before the final service is rendered to the tourist. Our next is heterogeneous. They are heterogeneous in the sense that what is marketed in different websites about different destinations is not what the tourist gets on the actual day of visiting the site. For example, if a tourist is interested in visiting Kakamega National Reserve, 
Uh, what they'll do is they'll go to their website and see very beautiful pictures together with the services that are being offered and also very beautiful pictures of the accommodation facilities. But when they go on the ground and visit or to a Kakamega National Reserve, what was posted in the website is not what they get on the ground. So most of these products are usually heterogeneous. Because of the marketing aspect of it, they tend to post very beautiful pictures on the website so as to attract quite a number of people. But when you go on down to the ground, what was posted is not what you experience. Seasonality of demand. Demand is usually the main component when it comes to the consumption and production of any tourism products and services. When the demand is low, the visitors are usually few. Hence, the destinations usually undergo a loss and vice versa. So, seasonality of demand in tourism can be divided into three where we have the off-peak, the off-peak or low season, that is between January and March. That is when people are not visiting any destinations because uh, of the fees. Most of the kids are going to school between January and people are trying to recover what they had spent during the holidays. Then we have the shoulder season. That is when we have a 50-50 kind of thing in the tourism industry. The industry can either receive visitors or not receive visitors. That's why it's called a shoulder season. It's a flexible season. With this season, you can either receive visitors or not receive visitors. So with the shoulder season, they usually are optimistic of either receiving or not receiving. Finally, we have the peak season, which begins from july and ends in december this is because of the migration at the masai mara national reserve and also the december holidays this is when schools are closed and families want to engage in domestic tourists that's why it's the peak season our demand is usually affected by different factors such as climatic conditions especially if they are harsh environmental factors economic factors how is the economy of a particular country or a part particular organization Political factors, especially the political instability, how does it affect the tourism industry against the demand? Social cultural factors, different people or different communities, how do they relate to the tourists? And finally, the technological advancements. Are these advance, advancements favoring the tourism industry or working against the tourism industry? Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.